this is Grad School 101. Uh, for those of you who are uh, joining, uh, my name is Christian Flores. I am the advising coordinator with Project Upgrads, and joining me, I have Vanessa Rubenfield from the uh, uh, Career Center. She is a career specialist for the College of ECS. Um, I don't know, Vanessa, if you want to talk a little bit about what you do for the Career Center. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Vanessa Rubenfeld. Um, so as the ECS Career Specialist, I uh, work in the Career Center, but I am the liaison as a Career Specialist specifically for the College of Engineering and Computer Science. Um, so we all work with each of the eight colleges. So we all have our liaisons for all, all the colleges. And um, I work with uh, anything career related, um, of course, involving graduate school. If you're unsure of what graduate school to go to or what programs, I help with um, that exploration process. Um, if you're unsure of, you know, the career paths you want to take, um, I help with that. I help with your actual job search or internship search um, and anything related like resume, cover letter writing, um, interview prep, um, and so on and so forth. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you. And then so, um, so I'm the advising coordinator with Project Upgrads. Uh, Project Upgrads is um, funded through a Title V grant from the U.S. Department of Ed. And our goal is to help, uh, you know, underrepresented students uh, basically apply and get into grad school and complete their programs. Um, you know, as first gen students, oftentimes it's a lot more difficult uh, navigating grad school uh, from the initial process of finding out which grad school is right for you, which program is right for you, um, to the process of, uh, you know, what um, policies are available to help me, uh, what resources are available to help me. And so Vanessa is one of these resources that is on campus, and uh, which is why she's here today to help with this workshop. Um, so uh, if you aren't following our Instagram, uh, please make sure to follow our Instagram. Um, you can scan this QR code. We do have more workshops. So if you have friends who are interested in grad school um, who aren't uh, in the College of ECS, we have uh, another workshop on March 9th, uh, another one on uh, March 15th, and one last one on the 23rd. Um, and we also will have more workshops in the fall that correlate to this workshop. They're kind of follow-up workshops. So if you're planning on applying to grad school in the fall, this they're kind of the workshops that... Um, uh, start off that process, kind of like applying uh, to the Cal State Apply website, um, filing your financial aid, or what kind of funding is available in grad school. So um, I highly encourage you all to attend those. This is kind of just the bare surface level um, of what grad school is, how it can help you. So um, again, this is just skating through the surface. So I encourage you to follow our Instagram for those updates, um, because there is definitely a lot more uh, information out there that we can provide you. Um, so what will we be going over today? It's gonna to be an intro to grad school. You know, what is grad school? What can what it can do for you? Um, how do you find a program in a school that's right for you? What does the application process look like? Um, what does graduate school funding look like? And any additional available resources on campus? So we'll, we're gonna be going ahead and touching on those um, today uh, as we move forward. And so kind of uh, going over this, so why go to grad school? Um, and there are plenty of reasons someone might, might want to go to grad school. And I'm going to go ahead and let Vanessa kind of uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Christian. So, yeah, definitely. There's a lot of reasons why you'd want to consider going to graduate school. Um, you know, whether you're kind of unsure about in terms of like, you know, the future income for yourself, like, you know, a lot of the greater income potential could come from a graduate school degree, um, a graduate degree. Um, and also uh, stats have, saying, have shown that you're less likely to be unemployed um, with a graduate degree. There's also an increase in leadership and management roles. So there are a lot of roles available to those with, um, especially, um, you know, not just if for those in engineering, you know, with an MS in engineering, um, you have a lot of more opportunities to become a manager of an engineering firm, um, especially in civil engineering and mechanical engineering, um, and even a lot of tech, tech industries as well. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for growth there. Um, there's a lot of opportunities too with an MBA um, and that's correlated too with um, computer science. So a lot of opportunities there to grow in your, your positions with a leader, uh, graduate degree. Um, it is required for some positions as well. Um, there's a lot of management roles out there that require master's degrees. Um, there's also greater ability to help your family and community uh, with that graduate degree, with that greater income potential, um, and definitely more access to healthcare and retirement plans, more access to a lot of opportunities um, that you may not see unless, you know, you have that graduate degree. 
those are a few reasons. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, and there definitely is um, a lot more access to potential jobs that might yes. not be available, which uh, Vanessa is going to go ahead and talk about as well. Yes. There's so, yeah, there's a greater amount of job opportunities opening up for you. So, it's a lab coordinator as one, um, computer systems analyst, um, web developer, information security analyst, software developer. Um, front and back end developer and to become a project manager as well. A lot of them have graduate degrees. Um, so you can enter the field. Uh, a lot of the engineering computer science fields, you can enter without a master's, but to really move up um, the ranks, you know, in a lot of companies and engineering firms, um, they're oftentimes looking for graduate degrees. So that is becoming more the norm than before. Um, so you'll see that more and more. And so the, you know, there is a lot of competition out there, um, not to scare anyone, but just to know that there are greater potential um, for this job, these are job opportunities and to become managers and leaders within these fields as well with a graduate degree. And also the differences in degrees you'll see um, even starting off, right? So each of these fields that, you know, we have civil engineering, computer, com uh, computer engineering, computer science, electrical and mechanical engineering, you'll see the uh, median salary really from Georgetown University, the source here, um, the, the general median salary here for the bachelor's, bachelor's degrees entering, right? But then you'll see there's a big difference for those median salaries uh, with those same fields, but for graduate degrees. Um, so those, let's say, entering the field with a graduate degree would have a greater uh, median salary um, than those with bachelor's degrees. So you'll see that it could, and it grows over time. Um, so you'll really see a big difference there um, over the course of time in terms of once you have that degree um, and then the roles that you'll be able to, uh, to have um, in these fields. So there is a big difference, I would say. And so, you know, in terms of graduate school, I just want to preface by saying this, it's not necessary for you to go to grad school. Um, however, um, you know, a lot of the times it's more than just the income, it's more about job fulfillment for some people. Some people feel more fulfilled within their roles um, if they have the ability to move upward uh, within the field. And so a graduate degree, as Vanessa was saying, does definitely secure the ability. And so graduate school, entering graduate school is definitely a whole different ball game than, uh, than undergraduate degrees. Um, and so here I included this comic strip, which I love this comic strip because as I was going through grad school, um, I actually experienced a little bit of this uh, dialogue with my mom. And so, um, you know, it's kind of, you know, well, uh, I'm defending my thesis, mom, you know, great. What does that mean exactly? Well, it means I'm very close to graduating, but there's still the possibility they will fail me and I'll have to stay here longer or drop out. And the mom says, so I shouldn't get too excited. And then a little excited would be nice. So it's kind of that under, you know, that misunderstanding of what, what, would it, what is graduate school? What does it look like? Um, what, what do you have to know before going? Um, like, what are the expectations? And so I'm gonna go ahead and talk a little bit about that too. Um, in graduate school, the structure is completely different uh, as opposed to undergraduate school. Um, so in grad school, uh, you know, you have a little bit more um, input or autonomy as to um, the kind of things you are able to learn. Uh, granted, there is a structured curriculum, but um, in terms of the knowledge you're able to, uh, to acquire, you are more so contributing back. So you are taking in as much as you're giving back, whereas in undergraduate, you are uh, expected to acquire as much as possible throughout that course of your career um, as a student. Um, whereas again, in undergraduate or as a graduate student, you are expected to contribute to research. You're expected to uh, give back to the um, academic community through that. Um, and so I, I always say, you know, uh, undergraduate students absorb knowledge, whereas graduate students create knowledge. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the main difference between the two. And so um, that's to say, you know, if you get a graduate degree, a lot of the people uh, have this, uh, misunderstanding that because you get a master's degree or a PhD, you have to go back and enter the academic field or the academic world as well, which is not always the case. You know, um, you can always enter, for example, there are people who have PhDs who go and work for, uh, you know, tech labs, like for example, with Pfizer, uh, or they go and they work uh, as engineers with PhDs for companies like Apple or Google. So it's not just necessarily academia that you can work in with a PhD or uh, a master's degree. 
um, you know, after finishing your um, undergraduate career, there's a lot of different opportunities that, that aren't just academia to, to, to kind of put it out there, but it's definitely always great to be able to contribute that knowledge that's brand new. Um, so again, what does grad school look like in terms of um, your academic expectations? So undergraduates um, with under a 3.0, um, are considered in good standing. So as long as it's above a 2.0, uh, it's okay. Uh, meanwhile, if, uh, under, if a grad student's GPA falls below a 3.0, you're placed on academic probation. So um, that's the difference between those in terms of GPA. Uh, meanwhile, in terms of coursework, um, the classes for grad students tend to meet once a week. That's usually the norm. Uh, some classes may be a little bit different depending on your program, but uh, typically they meet for about uh, three hours a week, uh, three hours once a week. Um, and the classes are less, so maybe a little bit less structured than a lecture, a typical lecture for an undergrad. They're more about, they're more uh, maybe guided discussions. You talk about the topic um, and you have a conversation with the professors, or maybe you go to a lab where you're um, performing, you know, experiments um, and, and again, uh, contributing to that, um, to your field. Um, and so most classes are also in the evenings. So a lot of the times, you know, especially in um, ECS, you know, I've uh, spoken with students who have full-time jobs and they're already engineers. And so their coursework uh, is in the evenings and they are uh, coming to school in the evenings uh, or online uh, virtually. And uh, their courses um, are kind of uh, supplemental to what they already, what they're already doing professionally. And so an average unit load is around you know six to nine units. So um, anywhere below that is usually uh, a part-time student, but six to nine is full-time for grad school. Uh, I know that as an undergrad, 12 and above is full-time um, and anything below 12 is part-time, but a grad student's uh, anything below or anything below six is part-time. Um, and there are some programs where 12 to 15 might even be the norm because uh, those programs require internships, but those programs are usually more so like social work, which wouldn't be in uh, this college per se. But again, there are some programs that do require that um, that rigor in them. Um, but these programs that you would be looking into more so are, are in the six to nine units range. Um, so that's kind of something to think about. So you, you usually normally be taking two to three classes a semester. I don't know, Vanessa, if you have anything to add to this. Uh, no, that, that's pretty much what it is. Yeah, and so um, you also, at the end of your program, uh, you also have what are called culminating experiences. And so every single program will uh, have culminating experiences. Um, if you're in an online program, it might be different in each program, might offer different variants. So say, for example, um, one program might offer just a comprehensive exam option. Uh, one program might offer just a, a comprehensive or thesis option. Uh, one other program might offer all three. So you have to pay attention to what your program expects of you. So as you're moving forward in your program, you can prepare for it because this um, culminating experience will be the final piece to your degree. Um, so if you're expected to write a thesis, what, in, what knowledge and information have you been acquiring or contributing to along the way in order to prepare to write this thesis so that in your final semester, you're working hard on your thesis to kind of uh, compile that information, that knowledge that you've been uh, thinking about. Um, so that's kind of important. Or for your comprehensive exams, what kind of questions have you been thinking about to answer on that comprehensive exam because these, uh, they're not necessarily, um, and it's not like a multiple choice test, they're like essay questions you have to answer um, in a certain amount of period uh, of time. So uh, those are things you, you have to kind of be thinking about consciously as you're, as you're moving forward in your program. Um, what, what culminating experience best fits me? Because um, everyone's different. Uh, say, for example, you know, in my master's program, uh, we had all three options and uh, different students chose different um, uh, culminating experiences that were right for them. Me personally, I chose uh, a thesis and that was the best, that was what was best for me because I like to do research writing. But someone else, they might like the comprehensive exam route because they're not mentally equipped, you know, to handle the, the aspect of writing a big research paper, but they are better at writing, uh, you know, uh, essay questions on the spot and they might, you know, they might be better at that ability, whereas I'm not. So um, there are these, uh, you know, you have to ask yourself, what am, what's best for me? 
So kind of as you move forward and as you get apply and get accepted or as you apply and look into programs, which I'll talk about in a second, make sure you're uh, examining what the goals are for, for that program for your culminating experience. Um, that goes into, uh, that kind of segues into how do you find a school and a program um, that, that's right for you. And that's something that, um, that you have to be consciously asking yourself um, as you start exploring, you know, what are your interests um, as well as your goals? How, how, what tools can you use to research those schools and programs? Um, and those tools might include Vanessa. Um, and how do you prepare uh, for your application, which also might include Vanessa, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second as well, as to why that might include Vanessa or the Career Center. Um, so how do you, how do you find, um, you know, how do you learn about your field or how do you learn what interests you? So, you know, you have multiple opportunities. You can attend local conferences or regional conferences or national conferences um, that are part of your field or your discipline, or you can even join national uh, discipline organizations. I know that there are national organizations for like psychology or sociology, like honor societies. You can participate in research projects, especially within um, the STEM fields. There are many uh, research opportunities within STEM fields to uh, contribute to. Uh, you can also volunteer. I know volunteering uh, in the uh, social sciences and the humanities is huge, especially if they plan on entering you know, uh, social work or counseling. But for many of you folks, uh, research opportunities are huge to exploring your interests. And also internships, um, which for you folks might also be a huge opportunity, especially you know, for these corporations um, that might eventually be employing you. Uh, finding those opportunities, which again, Vanessa might be a, a big help in helping you find. There are plenty of workshops that the Career Center actually offers in helping you find those internships that I highly encourage you attend. Um, and you can even take extra upper division courses. I know that many of your majors are high units, so maybe that's not uh, something that you might immediately be thinking about. Um, but uh, if you, you know, can take within your GEs like course that'll help you explore, um, I highly encourage that opportunity. But again, um, these are opportunities for you to understand kind of well, what are my interests, what are my end goals for my career, where do I see myself um, when, uh, you know, when I'm at the peak of my career. And, uh, you know, as you move forward, also develop your faculty references. Uh, you know, as I was talking, I was talking about, you know, research opportunities. Um, you know, that goes to say, talk to your faculty, who's teaching in your program. Um, you know, go to their office hours, even if you don't necessarily need help on an assignment, go and talk to them, you know, ask them questions. Where did they go to grad school? What did they research in grad school? What did they learn? What are their specialties? And kind of understand how you fit into that. Because these uh, individuals at one point, they were also in the field. You know, they had to have been in the field at some point or another for them to be teaching the content. So ask some questions, engage with them, um, and also let them uh, get to know you. What are your interests? Um, who are you as a person? Because chances are, because they've been in the field, they know people um, who they might be able to connect you with, whether it be someone who's um, in the field as uh, maybe an employer or uh, who works in a, in a management role. Um, they can also connect you with someone in academia who is at another university that you might be interested in in another program uh, for graduate coursework. That's something that's really, really important as well. Uh, those those networking, uh, those networks, because you're in that process building your network. So I highly encourage that portion to, to talk to your faculty because um, at the same time that you're developing that network, um, they're going to maybe be your, your references for your, your grad school applications because a lot of programs do uh, require references. Um, and so that goes to say, finding a school in a program, uh, talking to faculty is one of those key components, um, but also creating a list, you know, do you, you know, what are your needs? Do you see yourself moving away from your family? Do you see yourself, you know, or do you, are you already employed and do you need to stay close to work? Um, do you, is, is, you know, expense a big issue for you? You know, is that something that you consciously think about? Um, and, you know, you have to ask yourself, do you want to go public? Do you want to, do you want to go private? Um, these are questions you have to consciously be asking yourself as you're narrowing down your, um, your, your prospective grad schools. Um, and 
for example, you might not even think about a specific school because, um, oh, well, this school is in the middle of nowhere, but then, um, and, and maybe they don't have the, the best like ranking overall in the university, but maybe their engineering programs are, you know, the best engineering programs in the state or in the region. And uh, sometimes you have to remember engineering or sometimes specific programs um, rank higher than the university itself. Uh, and so that's really important to also take note of is uh, does the program itself rank high um, as opposed to the university overall? And is that something that you're, that's important to you? Um, so these are, these are things that's, that are important in helping you find a school and a program. Um, you know, as, as well as, you know, it's impo important for you to stay close to home. You know, uh, one important piece of advice that was given to me that I uh, took to heart, which was uh, the best piece of advice I ever got was, um, choose a grad school where you see yourself settling down because that's where your network is going to be created from. Your colleagues and your uh, cohort for grad school, they're going to be professionals in the field and they're going to be connected with you for, for the rest of your professional life. Um, and so if you ever need a job, maybe they're going to be able to connect you. Or if they need a job, you're going to be able to connect them and vice versa. Um, and your faculty and your program are going to be able to connect you. And so um, you're going to be deeply rooted wherever you decide to go to grad school. If you decide to stay home um, for grad school, then that's okay. And that's where you're going to be rooted professionally as well. Um, but it's important for you to consciously be thinking about those choices. Um, whereas if you go to grad school somewhere, you don't necessarily see yourself settling down and you try to uh, leave to a different region, uh, maybe uh, you go away and then you try to come back home, it might not be the best opportunity because you don't have the network established where you grew up. So that's kind of something you have to consciously think about um, as you also find programs and ask yourself, well, I don't necessarily see myself settling down there, so I maybe shouldn't go to grad school there. Um, that's something that, you, that I recommend you think about as well. Um, and so how do you gather information? There are plenty of online resources as well, you know, um, the there are you know like peterson's.com gradschool.com but ultimately uh one of the best uh resources i always say is go to the university's website where you're interested in uh looking into and see what faculty is there where they went to grad school or even the faculty here at fullerton and seeing where they went to grad school because every uh for every faculty member has a bio on their um on their faculty page and you can see where they went to grad school what their research interests are um, and you can learn more about them that way and where they went and how that kind of relates to you and your interests. Um, and you can also reach out to different faculty, different universities. Faculty are more than happy when prospective students reach out to them. Um, and I can, I can guarantee it that they're going to respond to you at some point um, and tell you more about the programs and how they can help you. Um, because ultimately their goal is for students to be um, enriched by what they have to offer. So I'm gonna just take a really quick pause. I'm gonna ask if there are any questions and then we can go ahead and move on from this portion and then go down to the next section. All right, so seeing as there are none, we're gonna go ahead and move on. Um, if you have any questions along the way that you see you know, something that might uh, be of a uh, question for you, then you can go ahead and raise your hand on the um, participants box and then I'll go ahead and stop, all right? So what does applying to grad school here at CSUF even look like? Um, so there is a two-step process to applying to grad school um, here at Cal State Fullerton and also at any other CSU. Um, you have to be what's called CSU eligible and then you have to meet program eligibility standards. Um, and so what it means to be CSU eligible, you have to have um, be near completion of your bachelor's degree, you have to have a 2.5 or above, um, and if you received your, for example, your bachelor's degree overseas, you have to have either um, your t uh, um, TOEFL, is it TOEFL scores, and uh, which are your English uh, uh, competency, um, and you, um, in order to prove basically that you are um, competent in the English language, um, and so those, there are certain standards that you have to meet, but there, uh, for many of you, you won't have to worry about those. Um, and you also have to meet program or department eligibility. And so program eligibility can be set at a higher standard than the CSU eligibility. So programs are allowed to set like their own um, standards 
for example, I always t explain it this way. It's kind of like the federal minimum wage versus a state minimum wage. The federal minimum wage is 725, and then states are allowed to set their higher minimum wage standards. Um, so even though um, the federal minimum wage is 725, California has a $15 minimum wage. It's kind of like that. The CSU sets this one standard and programs themselves are allowed to set any, an even higher standard that meets their criteria uh, and expectations for a student to enter their program. Um, and so how do you even apply? So the application process starts with uh, Cal State Apply. So calstate.edu slash apply. Um, and you would be required to submit um, the application uh, and you would submit your uh, any transcripts from any single college that you ever attended, even if it was like one class in the summer, like five years ago, uh, you have to submit every single transcript. Um, even if those uh, classes are already listed on your Cal State Fullerton transcripts, you still have to send those uh, transcripts separately um, because they're not taken locally here at Fullerton. Um, however, if you're uh, applying to uh, Cal State Fullerton, um, in most cases, you don't have to resubmit those transcripts. You might have to submit like the unofficial ones to the department, and that goes back to how do you apply to the programs. Um, but in order to apply to the university, you don't have to resend them if they are already on file. But say, for example, you took a class in the summer and the, the university doesn't have those uh, courses on file, then you have to like send those updated transcripts uh, back to the university to make sure that those classes are listed. Uh, so those are that's how you apply to the university. Um, the university, or rather, Cal State Apply has a um, system called Quadrant Four, and it has four quadrants. Um, one of them is like your basic bio, bio information. One of them is your academic information. One of them is like supplemental information based on like professional experience, which many times you don't really have to fill anything out there unless a program asks for it. And then the last one is the program materials, which um, that's what I'm going to get into next. Uh, so a lot of the times uh, the programs will ask for you to submit and upload everything there. Um, however, there are some programs that will ask you to submit everything separately, whether it be the, to an email address, whether it be mailed physically to the program, or they might even have a separate portal. Um, a lot of the times, though, they'll have you upload everything directly there. They might ask you, you know, for a statement of purpose. They might ask you for um, a uh, writing sample. They might ask you for the unofficial transcripts. Uh, so they might ask you for a, a different uh, variety of things, and it's important to check uh, on the uh, program or department website to talk to their uh, program's graduate advisor. Uh, so every single program at Fullerton has their own individual grad advisor that you can talk to and say, well, what are your uh, process for, what is your process for applying? Um, and also on that fourth quadrant on Cal State Apply, it will also list the process for applying. And a lot of the times, you know, I've sat with students and um, they ask me, well, what's the next step to applying? Or uh, they say, I finished my application. Why haven't I gotten a word from the program? And it's because they didn't read that page that instructs them how to apply to the program. And that whole page, that very first page, uh, gives them a, a whole like uh, list of instructions that they just didn't, uh, they, they overlooked. And it's, uh, just a matter of looking at that page to tell you how step-by-step uh, step to apply. Um, so again, it's important to uh, check Cal State Apply as you're applying. Um, the deadlines vary by program. Um, so even though the, um, the applications all open up on October 1st, um, every single program has a different deadline. So say, for example, there's some programs that their deadlines are as early as like December 15th. And there's some programs that their application deadlines are as uh, late as, um, uh, I've seen as late as June 1st, even July 1st. So um, anywhere between then programs are allowed to accept applications, um, but each program will be different. I know a lot of the engineering programs uh, are in the middle of the, the spring semester. So like March, April. Uh, so it's important for you to be checking those uh, for your specific program and what they require. I know that the um, the uh, College of ECS is very, very specific with how they want their applications to be submitted. So um, again, be very um, uh, cautious about what's needed for your program. Um, and so here are some of the, here are actually the programs that are offered uh, for grad programs at uh, Cal State Fullerton for the College of ECS, which includes, you know, civil engineering, uh, computer engineering, computer science, electrical engineering, uh, environmental engineering, which is an online program, uh, mechanical engineering, software engineering, which again, that's an online program, 
and then um, accelerated software engineering. So these are the programs that are offered here um, for the College of ECS. Um, again, I think there are a total of 52 programs as a whole that are offered here at Fullerton and a total of 258 graduate programs throughout the CSU. So this is just the tip of the iceberg for what the Cal State system has to offer and for what Cal State Fullerton has to offer. Um, as a whole. Again, as Vanessa was mentioning earlier, you know, you can um, get a, um, an MBA uh, in, uh, as opposed to a master's degree in uh, engineering. Uh, so there's definitely some uh, opportunities to, to be cross-disciplinary. Um, I want to go ahead and take a, a moment to pause and ask if there are questions as of now. See, I don't see any hands. So we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next portion, which so briefly talking about funding, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so yeah, what kind of funding is available um, here at Fullerton at the CSU level, um, specifically at Fullerton. Um, and so I wanted to first talk about the, the state university grant. So there's this common misconception with uh, among many students that there are no grants available for grad school. Um, however, that's not the case. And there's a lot of students that um, have come to me and said, well, I didn't get any uh, grants during undergrad because my parents made too much money, um, which you know is totally understandable. Um, however, once you enter grad school, um, your uh, financial aid is no longer dependent on your parents' finances. Um, from grad school on, you're considered independent. Even if your parents can still claim you on their taxes, um, you're financially considered independent per financial aid standards. Um, so uh, for the state university grant, you only uh, have to, you have to just make sure your FAFSA or California Dream Act application is on file by March 2nd. Um, you don't have to file anything separately other than those. Um, you have to be considered a California resident and you have to be attending a CSU. Um, and you, if you, uh, are not a California resident, but um, have AB 540, then you're also eligible. Um, and so the California uh, State or the State University grant, what it does is it covers state university fees. So the state university fees are just a base cost of tuition. Uh, and so the base cost of tuition um, is just that tuition itself. It doesn't cover, you know, the, the student union fee. It doesn't cover the student health center fee. It doesn't cover the rec center uh, fee, it, it, which uh, here at Fullerton, I believe it's a fork. I want to say it's six hundred and eighteen dollars a semester out of pocket that you would be paying. I um, I actually did the math the other day for what you would be paying out of pocket if you receive the state university grant, and this uh, grant covers up to one hundred and twenty five percent of your graduate program. So what that means is if you decide throughout your program that you want to take elective units, um, you are you can take elective uh, courses. Um, so long as it doesn't exceed 125% of your program. So say for, that's uh, around three elective classes throughout the course of your program, roughly. Um, so say if your program is a 30 unit program or 33 unit program, you can take two to three elective courses. Um, if your program um, is 60 units, um, there, are, there are programs that are 45 to 60 units because of internships. Um, you can take a little bit more than that. And that, the reason they do that is because a lot of students um, take longer to finish their theses or their uh, culminating experiences. So uh, this state university grant will cover 125% of your program. So just keep that in mind that this is available for funding as long as you file your FAFSA by that March 2nd deadline. So it's really important that you file before. Yesterday was the priority deadline uh, for FAFSA. Um, so if you didn't file your FAFSA yesterday um, or before uh, and you're continuing on as a student, as an undergrad student, make sure that you, you file that. It's not uh, like a cutoff, but it is priority deadline. Um, so just make sure you're aware of those dates and that's a recurring deadline. So say for example, next year when you file for FAFSA again, it'll be the same deadline. It opens up October 1st and it uh, cuts off on March 2nd for priority. So it's a really important date for you all to remember. And um, it's important because on October 1st, that's the same date that grad school applications open. Um, and uh, March 2nd is uh, the, the cutoff for FAFSA. So again, um, and say, for example, you are going to attend grad school for spring, just as an example. You still need to have your FAFSA on file before March uh, 2nd, the, the year prior. So it's really important to kind of think about, well, when am I going to start grad school? 
um, and have that FAFSA on file, even if uh, you're going to take like a semester gap or if you're going to be enrolled in like kind of students who like graduate in the fall. Um, it, it's a really weird transition period, I know for some of you, um, it, but it's important to have FAFSA on file. And so let's talk a little bit about loans because um, this one's a really huge one, especially now um, that we're kind of having this um, moratorium on student loans. Um, right now, student loans are at an all-time high uh, in terms of uh, percentage rates. Uh, the federal direct uh, unsubsidized Stafford loan is at 5.28%. Um, and so the unsubsidized Stafford loan, basically what it means is that the instant that this loan gets dispersed to you, it starts accumulating interest. And that's why it's important to understand that this, uh, this uh, loan is at an all-time high. Um, and in years prior, it's been significantly lower. Um, and the reason it's important to also understand is because a lot of students see that they're getting offered $20,000 a year and they, they get excited, they take out all this money and then um, they graduate and they say, okay, I have $40,000 in student loans from a program that only costs 16,000. And, um, you know, as you move forward in your career, you realize, well, I wanna buy a house, but then you have all this debt from loans you didn't necessarily need. Um, and same thing with, you know, the direct uh, plus loan for grad students, you do, that one does require credit check, but I'm saying, what I'm saying is you don't necessarily need um, to take these out if you are um, being financially intelligent. Um, and so, when, but if you decide that that's this, this is what you do need. I know some students, for example, maybe they didn't file their FAFSA on time, or maybe they um, don't qualify for um, the, the state university grant. So say, for example, some students, they are already in the field and they are, their, income to, their income is significantly higher than someone who um, isn't working yet, uh, which happens a lot with um, students who are in engineering. Um, that, that's often the case. Um, and so that's why I'm going to talk about scholarships in a second. Um, uh, you know, this might be a route that you might consider. Um, and it's not the only route. Again, I'm going to bring up scholarships in a second, but it's something that might be uh, kind of on, on the back of your mind. Um, but there are scholarship opportunities on campus, which includes, you know, the Giles T. Brown Travel Grant, um, which the travel grant is basically to cover, you know, uh, expenses for uh, traveling to, for uh, conferences. Um, and then there's a Julian Tagashi Living Legacy Endowed Scholarship, which is uh, for continuing full-time computer science students. Um, and then there is, you know, the Lucas Aerospace Cargo System Scholarship uh, for Mechanical Engineering and Design. Um, there are plenty of scholarships. These aren't the only ones. There's the Alumni Association Student Scholarship, the Chicano Latino Faculty and Staff Association Scholarship. There are tons of scholarships published on the Cal State Fullerton website, and many of these scholarships only require one application for you to be submitted into like a pool of scholarships. So um, you don't even have to like submit like individual applications. You only need to submit one application uh, for hundreds of scholarships uh, here at Cal State Fullerton. But then there are um, scholarships, for example, like this one that I actually oversee um, called the Palante Fellowship. This one does require a separate scholarship. Um, and this one, uh, you get five, uh, $500 in the fall, 500 in the spring. However, you also um, are required to attend, for example, workshops put on by the Career Center. Um, you are re uh, required to attend cohort meetings. Um, and you also do get faculty mentorship. You are assigned a faculty mentor and you meet with them periodically throughout the semesters that you are in the program. Um, so it does help with career development, if that's what you're looking for as well. Um, so it is an amazing opportunity. A lot of the students who are in the, um, the program uh, do definitely enjoy it because they are exposed to do opportunities they wouldn't have otherwise thought of. Um, so it's something that you should definitely consider. There's also the Grad Equity Fellowship. Um, and this one uh, is for students who, uh, again, uh, do need that funding. Um, and this is, uh, for now, this one hasn't been determined as far as the deadline yet. Um, but it, they can grant you for anywhere from $500 to $2,000. Um, and it, it kind of aims to help students who really want to continue moving forward, especially like for PhD research. Um, and PhD research in the STEM fields uh, for prospective you know, students, I highly recommend if, if this is something you kind of want to consider doing, I highly recommend it. Um, 
And so kind of uh, another opportunity is also uh, graduate assistantships or TA ships or uh, research assistantships on campus. And so ways to find out about these are, you know, the Career Center, um, then each individual college will have some of these posted uh, on their college websites or the departments will. Um, and faculty might also ask you personally, do you want to be, uh, you know, my GA or my TA or my RA, my research assistant, um, or even the Office of Grad Studies will post some of these. But um, there are opportunities to also uh, participate in these opportunities. Um, and, you know, it's really cool to look into, this, especially if you want to maybe get a master's and be faculty to be, to be a TA and you teach your own class um, or to get into research and to be a research assistant. Because if you're a research assistant, uh, maybe one of these faculty members will, will include your name in their published um, journal article. So it's kind of something to kind of think about as well moving forward, because these are paid opportunities. You get a paycheck. It's not something that's going to go directly to your financial aid. Um, so as you transition into grad school, there's also additional support uh, through um, the Office of Grad Studies and Project Upgrads. Um, so we have the Office of Grad Studies, which is uh, in College Park, uh, 950. Um, there, you know, we're there from 8 a.m. to 4.30. However, there's also the, um, the uh, GSSC, um, which, you know, we here provide academic policy support, advising, um, any kind of student support. And so the reason I want to talk about it um, we're actually going to be rebranding. We're going to change the name to the Graduate Study Center, and we're going to be moving from PLS 365 into um, LH 216 uh, starting on April 1st. Um, and basically, it's a study space for um, prospective and current grad students. Well, we host workshops. Uh, there are graduate success consultants. There are charging stations. Uh, we have computers, whiteboards, um, and it's a nice space for students to basically join um, in and kind of study. And it's, um, you know, pretty cool. 